Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Scott Melbourne and I am the director of the Schneider Museum of Art, part of the Oregon Center for the Arts here at SOU. Please note that we have you all on mute and please stay on mute until the end of the talk. If you have any questions, please type those into the chat or save them for the end of the talk. Today I have the pleasure of introducing our special guest, Avantika Bawa who is participating in our new and exciting outdoor exhibition titled Art Beyond. The ex exhibition brings together more than two dozen artists for outdoor site-specific installations, programs, and more. Avantika Bawa is an artist, curator, and educator based in Portland, Oregon, and often resides in her, her hometown of New Delhi, India. Bawa has an MFA in painting from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BFA from the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University in Baroda, India. She has participated in Skowhegan, McDowell, Kochi Biennial Foundation and Jirasi residencies, among others. Noteworthy solo exhibitions include the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon, Schneider Museum of Art Suyama Space in Seattle, Washington, the Columbus Museum in Columbus, uh, Georgia, Salt Works Gallery, and the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center, both in Atlanta, Georgia, Nature Morte and Gallery Mascara in India, White Box Tilt Gallery in Project Space, and Disjecta, all three in Portland, Oregon. In April 2004, she was part of a team that launched Drain, a journal for contemporary art and culture. In 2014, Avantika was appointed to the board of the Oregon Arts Commission. She is currently Associate Professor of Fine Arts at Washington State University in Vancouver, Washington. Please join me in welcoming Avantika Bawa. All righty, hi. Thank hi, you so Monica. much. Uh, How are you today? Great. I am good, a little frantic, but good. Um, I'm in San Francisco right now. And I had to spend five minutes figuring out how to diffuse the sunlight. It's a problem we're not used to in Portland, Oregon. So it was kind of nice to actually deal with too much sunshine, which, which is something I, I miss uh, up there. It's also really nice to see many familiar faces. All the amazing folks who helped me with that mad yellow structure that I hope you'll see some of my friends and students from Savannah and Atlanta. It's, it's a pretty great and eclectic mix. Um, and I've been on the road for the past month, basically changing destinations every four days. So my headspace is a little kind of messed up. So pardon me if I sound like someone who might be going back and forth between different projects and conversations. And feel free to interrupt me. I don't know what the general process is, uh, I know a lot of artists prefer to just give their talk and then have questions. Um, I think that can get a little monotonous. So if you wanna just interject, I don't know what would be the easiest way, maybe in the chat, maybe Scott or Emily can alert me to a question that might be coming up and either you can put it in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask that question, yeah? Yeah, thanks Avantika. Yeah, normally we do um, ask people to type their questions into the chat or at the end of the talk, um, our audiences will be invited to unmute and share the video and ask you their uh, questions directly. Okay, so uh, I'll be respectful. Let's stick to that process. But if there is a tearing question, burning question, please do ask. Uh, we're, we are open to working with how artists like to operate, so. Okay, then interrupt because I do that too. So um, I wanna start by just thanking Scott and everyone at the Schneider Museum of Art for making this, uh, this opportunity a reality. I just saw Desert X and I think in the last talk I did, 
I spoke about how mediocre Desert X was because the new new thing is art beyond. So it's it's recorded for all the Californians too. I poo poo Desert X because art beyond is where it's at, and I'm very very pleased and honored to be one of the first artists of this uh, this amazing outdoor experience. And although it was just a month ago, it feels like a long time ago when half of you guys were just like laboriously painting everything around you yellow. And I'm sure Zach's shoes are still yellow and Shayla finds little dregs of yellow in her hair somewhere and Tori can't wait to jump on the scaffold because that was something they were obsessed with, which gave me great joy. All right, so I'm gonna share screen. I think you guys can see my first slide, which is uh, the mega installation I did just before the one at Willowit Ranch where my yellow scaffold currently resides. Um, I'm gonna kind of walk you through a few projects highlighting the scaffold works in particular and maybe a few works for my drawing series. Um, and, and also in the process, just give you a sense of why I make the decisions I do. And there's no real chronology to this order. It's more kind of a formal aesthetic. Um, I grew up in India, as um, Scott mentioned, I got my undergraduate degree out there. Um, I, although I was born in Southern India, I spent my entire life moving every few years. My dad was in the Indian Navy which required us to literally uproot ourselves and relocate and then relocate again. So this idea of moving from one landscape to another, settling, navigating, kind of feeds my personality, but I've also realized it feeds my practice. I find it very easy to settle into new places, but I also find myself bored with places, which is why working site specifically kind of worked nicely. It, it satisfied my quest to explore new landscapes and then move on to the next, embrace a sense of temporality without really ever longing for something that was very uh, finite and finished. So um, while thinking about navigation, a lot of my work, as you will see, is very site specific and it's, it's installation based. But this one project I started in 2013 was more about navigating and creating minor installations, interventions and performances in different coastal towns. Coastal towns in India, Kochi being one specific one, and also Astoria, Oregon, because it was the graveyard of the Pacific Northwest, Annapolis and Baltimore on the East Coast. Annapolis, because I was interested in its history as uh, the, the, the base for the Naval Academy. So I'm gonna maybe just show you a little bit of this and then explain or try and give you a sense of what I was trying to do. In all my past talks, I've over explained this project. This is a short video that is documenting these different journeys. It might require me to scrub forward. in India, Kochi, no, Kochi is one of the southernmost coastal towns and it is of uh, historic importance to me because this is where Christopher Columbus wanted to land when he chanced upon the United States instead. Historically, it's also a place for many silk fruits, spice fruits, etc. and deep tracking some of these routes that were of cultural importance uh, military importance and just historically important uh, something I was kind of doing.
Okay, sorry about that. I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Basically, you will see what I was trying to do in these works is track routes that a GPS pin was uh, showing you on a screen. And my, my goal was to actualize some of these dotted lines, these dotted lines that were serving as markers of historic, military, or cultural importance. And the question I asked myself is, what if this dotted line actually existed in space, like a little blob of orange or red? So I literally proceeded to uh, design an orange inflatable, tow it to either a, a, can, a, a, a passenger ferry or a local boat or a, a little steamship and then just see what would happen if the ball was dragged throughout these different journeys. Um, I'm going to go back a second and can you guys see my computer now? Still see a screen? Yes. Okay. So this is through my website. So this is a little faster. Embedding video and PowerPoints is a little, not the greatest idea. So here we see the ball floating through the backwaters of Cochin. I'm scrubbing through so you can see it in Astoria. So I chose this for your Oregon. Sorry. Sorry, Ivantika. It's still just on the the link. Oh, right. Okay. Mapping. Yes. I'm yeah. so sorry. Okay. There we go. Okay. So here we are in Oregon, on the mouth of, of the River Columbia, and you can see the orange what somewhere out there in the distance. In this little shot, it almost kind of disappears. Here I've scrubbed forward to where the little orange dotted line, AKA the GPS pin is uh, floating through parts of Annapolis and scrubbing forward. You see it moving through further down in, in Annapolis, further down here is the Naval Academy. And here we are entering the Chesapeake Bay. So again, with all of these things, I was very interested in the absurdity of an orange dot pretending to be an actual GPS pin and formally, what would happen when this blob of orange was just set in an open field of blue oceans with the blue skies in the background, and in some cases, just completely disappear. So this piece project was called Aqua Mapping, since the intention was to really just see what would happen when, um, when I was mapping things through my own language of an intervention via an orange dot on an open blue space. So here's a few stills from that project and a little example of the way I show the work. This is at Saltworks Gallery in Atlanta. I had a projection and prints on the wall. Um, I then had a show of the same at White Box Gallery, which is part of the UFO in Portland, Oregon, the University of Oregon. This presentation was kind of the most solid since I had the projections of the videos taken from Astoria, uh, India, and, and also Annapolis slash Baltimore. And this projection was done in Mumbai on the rooftop of the gallery that I work with, with the Arabian Sea in the background. So I also enjoyed how not only was I making three individual performative videos or installations, but also changing the way the work was presented every time it was installed, either just as prints, video stills, or a combination of, of all of the above. In this project too, what I started doing, I'm normally, I work mostly with drawing, painting, and sculpture. This was one of the first few times I was working more with video. And being as I'm a drawer and more interested in still images, it made sense to just make still images from these video stills. And since that didn't feel enough, I did a little screen printing so that the idea of marking and pointing, which is what the GPS dot was trying to do, was further reinforced by these orange blobs that I put on the print digital prints that I screen printed. I kind of enjoyed the tongue in cheekness of making something that's obvious, even more obvious. So that was one project where, you know, I was doing things that weren't quite normal and I'm jumping forward, not quite normal as in working with video, a medium I'm not that familiar with, but it allowed me to just travel a lot more and explore spaces that were less familiar to me. I'm jumping from that project to one I did at the Schneider several years ago. 
Um, I know a few of you came to see that show, and I think I see Cody on this talk. It was, it was over a drink or a chat with Cody where I, I, I think I arrived at the idea of wanting to do something in response to Emigrant Lake and uh, Dead Indian Memorial Road. I thought both those names were kind of weird. And in reading upon the history about Emigrant Lake, and I think this is one audience I don't have to explain any of that to, there was something bizarre about the artificiality of that lake, something really disturbing about how the lake was the reason an entire town had submerged. And again, something really weird and disturbing about a road that partially disappeared and is still called Indian Memorial Road or Dead Indian Memorial Road. So when I was asked to do this project by invited by Erica Lepman back in 2014 and was asked to consider the idea of site, the site of the inside of the Schneider Museum was nice, but a little too cold. It was kind of perfect, but a bit too perfect to serve as a prompt for things that I wanted to do about the gallery itself. And that's when I looked outside and it was in that conversation with Cody and getting to know a little more about the history of Emigrant Lake, Indian Memorial Road, et cetera, that I thought, be, I thought it would be interesting to recreate that artificiality in the form of this big blue swath. And also in the process paying homage to the city of Ashland being this major city for theater and props and backgrounds. So my big blue swath was this artificial thing mimicking Emigrant Lake and it appeared to be sitting on a shelf that got narrower as it traversed the space, ending eventually in the middle of the space by sitting on a rock that was borrowed from the site of an Indian um, emigrant lake and eventually returned. And again, for this work too, I thought it would be fun to make some prints and uh, digital prints that were superimposed with some screen prints. Since there was a sense of a background and, and a stage and a performative element, it also made sense for me to invite students from SOU, the dance performance, uh, the dance class, who created a piece responding to the idea of submerging and drowning. And Terry Longshaw and his crew, who are going to perform again, who did some experimental sound pieces uh, related to the idea of water and uh, water sounds. And then Christine Williams, who did this beautiful vocal piece, again, about submerging and, and sinking. So this work, essentially of simple blue swath, wanted to acknowledge the vastness of the gallery, the boxness of its architecture, but also draw attention to the artificiality of Emigrant Lake and Indian Memorial Road. And when you looked, when you stood in the middle of the space, you certainly, I think, got a sense of something that was just like submerging and gradually just sinking. And I, as once again, it was a pleasure coming to Ashland at that time and working with everyone at the Schneider Museum and at Southern Oregon University. So it's, it was great that I was invited back. Um, as you guys know, a lot of my work in the past six, seven years has oscillated more towards scaffolds. Scaffolds are a man-made ubiquitous structure. They are very kind of utilitarian. And when people ask me, why am I fascinated by this, this object that is a functional thing that looks like a grid? And my answer is exactly all those reasons. It's a three-dimensional uh, drawing. It, is, it has horizontals, verticals, and diagonals, elements that I use a lot in my own work. And I like how universal it can be. You can be in any part of the country and find the same kind of scaffold. And although, many countries in Asia, India specifically, has its own version of a bamboo scaffold. It's, we, we can get metal scaffolds that look just like this. So I like that there is a, li a little sense of localness in the material I'm using, but there is a universal universality in, in this material and it's essentially a functional material, but when painted and placed in a different context, it changes meaning altogether. Uh, this was the first time I used a scaffold. It was at a gallery in Mumbai, India, Gallery Mascara. This, mascara, uh, this gallery was historically a warehouse. So the first show I did in here that I don't have on this presentation was it me responding to its history as a warehouse. But for this particular show, what I thought would be fun is to respond to what was happening outside the uh, building, which is a lot of construction. So I proceeded to create my own little construction site 
And to the construction site, I added a series of photographs. The photographs were essentially drawings in construction sites um, placed on objects that looked like easels and workhorses, but was really a combination of a workhorse and an easel. We teasingly call them weasels. And then these, these drawings that were on easels, weasels were photographed. And that suite of photographs was placed in this mock construction of mine for the show called Another Documentation. Uh, the bright orange structure in the middle was kind of like a modern day Tower of Babel, mimicking, mocking, and but also drawing attention to the endless construction, the vertical construction that is going on and was going on in the city of Mumbai. By just taking something that already exists in space, exists in the universe and just changing it by changing its context and color, I think I managed to create a sculptural experience that was quite different. So here you see that suite of drawings, or sorry, photographs in the background. By putting little things of black on the structure, my goal was to kind of highlight aspects of the structure, just like punctuation does to a block of text. But in, in this work, you know, much as I enjoyed this whole project done in 2016, when I went on to do my next scaffold works, um, these are just a few more images here. You also see, you know, a little bit of this added sculptural element, which is soil from a neighboring construction site, metal plates from another construction site, scrolls of paper that are mimicking prints coming out of a plotting machine that are going askew. So there was a lot going on in this installation, even though the core focus was the orange scaffold. So in 2016, when I was invited to be part of the Portland Biennial curated by Michelle Grabner, I, I thought it would make sense to work with the scaffold again, because I was interested in this as a structure and I didn't think I'd done enough with it with just one show. But I also made a decision to keep it simpler this time. And instead of having sand and photographs and all those other things, just the scaffold in itself was probably enough. Um, I painted the scaffold a gold so that it drew attention to the derelict structure it was sitting in, which was the interior of the Astor Hotel in, in Astoria. This is a hotel that was prosperous and booming at one time and then it fallen apart and it was in decay till about 2015 or so when a developer bought it and has been trying to reconstruct and bring it back to its glorious days. It, I thought it would be fitting then to paint the scaffold gold, gold being a color that's ceremonious. And, you know, if as a, as a token of luck in India, China, we give people things that are in gold as a way to trigger more wealth and prosperity. So I, I found it fitting to paint this thing gold and titled it Mineral Spirits because mineral spirits is the material I use to first literally degrease and clean the scaffold. And Mineral Spirits was also a way to draw attention or pay homage to the past guests of this hotel. So in a nutshell, this work really was just the scaffold, highly dramatic lighting where shadows were crucial and also a sound component that played intermittently and the sound was the recording, the building of the scaffold itself. So it felt a little eerie if you were walking around the space because it was cold, empty, just light and darkness and occasionally the sound of clanking like there was someone up there from the past. Um, I will talk about one more scaffold series, two more scaffold works, but as a quick de de departure, I just also want to talk a little bit about my drawing practice. Uh, working with installations is great, um, but I, I also have a drawing practice which allows me to be self absolutely independent. I'm not relying on anyone. And uh, these drawings that I make are often either part of an installation or they're completely independent. And I find these works very deliberate and determined because I'm working mostly on the formal elements of composition, line, shape, and color. That said, although my drawings were always standalone pieces in 2013, I started looking more closely at structures in Portland with a big fascination for the Memorial Coliseum. Again, I'm speaking to mostly Oregonians out here and you know, you've probably 
If you've been to Portland, you've seen the Veterans Memorial Coliseum. It's right by the Modus Center. It's a building whose stock symmetry and grid I appreciate greatly. It is also a building where my home team, our home team, the Portland Trailblazers, won their one and only championship. So it made sense to just make, make a drawing of this building. And from one drawing, I started to make many, many more. And I didn't have to think about what I wanted to do. The Memorial Coliseum was the question mark and I wanted to see how many answers I could give it and different ways in which I could answer it. Whether it was a straightforward approach while embracing everything I knew and would teach about linear perspective, as you can see in this work, or pushing abstraction and the language of painting further as you see in a work like this. Um, of course, that's a little homage to the Blazers. And for those of you who are even remotely fans of this team, which I hope is all of you, there is a, a very crucial game tonight, so please watch it. So all these works eventually led to a show at the Portland Art Museum curated by Grace Cook Anderson. Um, and it was a nice way to showcase, hold on, I'm so sorry. I have something playing in the background. I just have to stop that. It was a, it was a good way for me to um, bring all these works together. The show at the museum at the apex space, whether it was drawings, paintings, prints, et cetera. While this show was going on, I had, a, I had a satellite show at Ampersand Gallery and Project Space, which was on the other side of town in the Albina Quarter, uh, which was a district in Portland that was gravely affected when the Coliseum was built. So much as I appreciate and admire the structure of the building, I know it has a tainted past in when it was erected. Um, these were some prints that I did at the same time while at residence at Crow Shadow in Pendleton. It was really great to work with lithography in stone and digitally for the first time with master printer Judith Bauman, who was at Crow Shadow. And this, this, this fascination with that one building also lent itself to a project, which was a limited edition artist book, the first artist book I'd ever done that was uh, designed by Martha Lewis, who is a designer based in Portland. And it had text contributions from Brian Libby, who is an architectural journalist, journalist based in Portland, and also Grace Cook Anderson. And then was my fun moment when the Blazers invited me to do a poster for a game against Chicago, which we thankfully won. So in this poster, I, you know, I drew attention to the skyline of, of uh, Chicago and Portland. The irony here, though, is like I think the section about for Chicago turned out better because Cumulatively, maybe Chicago has a stronger uh, architectural skyline. All right, right after uh, my fascination with the Coliseum was kind of dwindling, though it's a building I will always admire, I thought it would be interesting to choose another building to focus on, and that was the Ice Cube building in Atlanta, Georgia. I lived in Atlanta before I came to Portland, and this is a building I would see often. It, is, it, it was a building that housed the archives for the state of Georgia and was a monolithic marble structure with no windows. An architectural marvel, in my opinion, but sadly, because of what it was doing to the land, which basically it was sinking the land, uh, the city officials decided to demolish it in 2017. And when I started working on drawings for this building, it was kind of during the pandemic, just before the pandemic. So I started by just making small, simple drawings in my studio at home because that was the only space I could work in. And by, again, allowing myself to make the same composition over and over again, I was also kind of embracing the monotony and the repetition of our routine, especially last year in March, April, where things were almost the same, but globally every day, something was changing on a large scale. So those smaller drawings and sketches eventually led to larger graphite works. These are 22 by 30. The black is all paint. The silvery gray is all graphite. 
And in all of these works, the challenge was to keep them almost the same, but have a slight change in either scale or a slift in uh, shift in composition. And these led to a show at the end of the year at a project in Atlanta called The End Space. And I'm still kind of working on these works, but for now it's on pause. So that was a little peek at one of my drawing projects. Currently, besides the ice cube building, I'm also working on drawings of 432, uh, which is a building in Manhattan. It's a skinny tall structure, the skinniest tallest you will see in the Manhattan skyline. And whether you like it or not, you will notice it. Just like the ice cube building, it is under controversy. I don't know why I'm fascinated sometimes by buildings that are controversial or might be demolished, but whether it was the Coliseum or 432, the skinny building in, in Manhattan or the ice cube building, um, there's also definitely an interest in the symmetry or the structure, the physicality of the building that keeps me engaged. All right, so this project, now I'm going back to scaffolds and talking about this third project I did, which was in India. And the idea to do this was literally something that came on a whim. When I was driving in Pendleton, I decided one day I wanted to have a pink structure in the middle of a vast open field that was white. Initially, I thought it would be in Iceland, but Iceland is impossible to work in, especially when it's just this vast and white because it's also very, very windy. And then I started to think about uh, the salt flats in India. And I somehow miraculously found the perfect people to work with who had an industry in a very remote part of the salt desert. And with the industry came a lot of people who were tasked the job of doing whatever I needed to do with them. So this all happened within 10 days. I was flying from Portland to Amsterdam and on that on my halfway journey, they said, we're not hiring scaffolds, we're just buying these for you. And by the time I arrived on site, the scaffolds were being primed. And my job was just to figure out what formation I wanted. And I can decide the formation to some extent before I get to the site. But once I get to the site is when I really make my decisions on how I want things organized. And since this is a factory that created bromine, which is a very toxic liquid, there was a lot of boxes that contained, that housed the bottles of bromine. And those became my Lego pieces where I did the different formations to finally choose the one I went with. Um, I often get asked how I choose my colors and 98, 99% of the time it's a gut reaction, but then I go back on that gut reaction to see why it makes sense. I knew I wanted this scaffold to be pink. And I think part of that influence came from uh, the flamingos in the local area and also the embroidery, which is kind of really stark and gorgeous. And the shocking pink is a dominant color. There's a glow in the sunrise in the morning, which, was, which is also very pink that helped choose and finalize my pink. Unlike uh, the US where at Home Depot, you can have many choices of colors and go back and forth in India, especially if you're in a more remote area, you don't get that many choices. So I was having a field day with this guy, trying to get him to mix different, different combinations of pink so that we got the pink we wanted, but in the kind of paint, uh, the enamel paint that would be resilient to the strong sun outside. And here we go. And all of you guys who worked with me on the yellow, you probably resonate with that. So yeah, here I'm literally just posing. They didn't let me do much painting, but if I was in the factory site, I had to wear a hard hat. Um, the men who helped me do this, they were people who worked in the factory, but they're basically uh, laborers from neighboring villages, simple, nice people. And when I got there, they didn't quite get why, what the hell I was doing and why I wanted to erect a big pink scaffold in the middle of nowhere. But, you know, I said, just, just wait and see. So here we are, every day we would go to the site, we could drive to a certain point, And after a point, you had to just walk because it's salt and sand. Uh, if you drove in, you'd really just get stuck. So either you went with a camel or a tractor, both of which would have left tracks that I didn't want. And we didn't really have camels and tractors over there. So we had to just carry the scaffolds every day. And for two days, 10 people, including myself, we were just carrying the scaffolds <coughs> until we got them to the location. 
And then gradually we started building slowly. And this was, this was away from the main site. This is where we would come for tea breaks. This was the section that was closer to where we would be parked. It's where we would have our morning breakfast, our morning tea. It was kind of the base camp. And then after time at base camp, we would go back to the site and start building the scaffold one layer after the other. So on the third day of the install, when we had climbed to about three levels at 5 p.m. on the third day, when the workers just stopped because they kind of unionized, they said, they, they literally stopped and started taking photographs with their flip phones or fancy set phones. And I asked, I said, why are you doing this? They said, we want to take a photograph and send it to our wife back in the village. And our, we want to share it with the kids. It was like, why? It's just a pink scaffold, like you said. They said, no, but there's something about it that makes us smile and makes us happy. And then I just looked at them and they're like, oh, so it's, they, then they were like, yes, now we get why you did this. Like, there's no logic to it, but there's something joyous about just seeing this. And it just tingles and makes you happy. So that kind of a response from a non-art person, quote unquote, for me was more satisfying and touching than any other major critique I've gotten or review I've gotten. So these are just a few more shots of the scaffold gradually being erected and on and on. And that's my crew. They were again, just super fun people to work with. We didn't really advertise this because it wasn't done through a major gallery or anything. It was through this industry. But on the day that we kind of finished the install, we did ask uh, the local tourist campsites to bring their guests if they wanted. And by the evening, it was a party and people were just flocking to it unannounced. And they just, they were drawn to it like a magnet and they, they thought it was a selfie point. And I didn't give too many reasons about why I built it. I said, it's a pink scaffold in the desert. Think of it what you want and enjoy it for what it is. And that's kind of what they, they did. So these are just a few more shots over the course of the day. And this, this was a beautiful surprise. I'd never thought of what it might look like at night. And I always just envisioned it on a big open white space. But at night too, it took on this whole new magical response because there's no night pollution, sorry, uh, light pollution in the desert. One could actually see these stars, none of which have been photoshopped. Um, let's see if this plays. Can you guys see my video? No, it's still on the slide. Okay, so this is what happens. Sometimes we just have to go back and forth. This is the last, so this is a short little video that documents. And you can see it now, right? The video? Yes, we can. Thank you.
Okay, I'm going to go back to my presentation now. So uh, the music you heard in the uh, was basically the local folk musicians. This part of India, the run of Kutch, is very nomadic. It's in a very kind of extreme climate. It's also right by the border of Pakistan. And it's also a region that has changed a lot because of changes in climate. So all of these things, even though I didn't talk about them directly, the location next to a strategic international border, uh, it's, it, it, it's a region that has seen a lot of change because of global warming. All of these things were important. And I was hoping that the work was visually strong enough that if someone wanted to read into that a little further and think about those ideas a little further because of the pink serving as a prompt, that was a success. And many people did. People have used it as a cover for books talking about climate change, queer politics, international issues, et cetera. So again, for me, when abstraction lends itself to these layers of interpretation, it just takes on a stronger, deeper meaning. So this installation, uh, uh, this it, work was installed in December 2019, and it was relocated to a nicer, wider space in February with the intention of taking it down by April, since the land gets soft and it can set, set a sink in. But by April 2020, there was a lockdown, and the scaffold is still out there. By July, when monsoons hit India, it was engulfed by water. And I wanted someone to go out and take photographs of this super changed landscape, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, no one could. And that's why this image isn't the best because one of my friends on site who works at the factory, he took it with his little phone camera and I said, I need something better. They're like, there's no one around to take photos. Finally, when someone could go, it had started to collapse. And there was something beautiful about the scaffold that had just stood there for so long was also starting to collapse, but part of the structure is still very much intact. And this is the book I was kind of referencing. This is my colleague at Washington State University who has just come out with this book. And I was very honored when he asked if my scaffold could serve as the image for his cover because it just made sense. I was like, go right ahead. So while the pandemic was on, I couldn't do any major scaffold works because it requires physical uh, help. I mean, I think I'm strong, but you guys have seen like, you know, unless you're Scott, you can't really build a scaffold by yourself. I was very impressed by how quickly some of you worked, but I I don't have the wingspan to, to build some of these things completely by myself. But I wanted to do more with scaffolds. So what I did was printed them in miniature, which is these 3D pieces. And between November, December, whatever mini travel I was doing either to Port Townsend or Coopville or Gherat in Oregon, I took these little things with me and made micro installations that eventually led to the show at Agenda Gallery, a newer space in, in Portland. And for that show, instead of just having cheap plastic prints, I worked with a company in New York called Shapeways to print the same thing in nickel plated steel. And I created a mini show called Constructing Darkness where the sound of the 3D printer, the sounds of previous scaffolds being assembled were also played intermittently throughout the show. And while I was doing that show, I wanted to make a drawing component, but instead of drawings, I somehow decided to make prints and embossings and rubbings on paper. So the show had basically a mini installation in the front room and in the back room, there was a book of, uh, embossings. And these embossings were embossings of the original 3D printed scaffolds in plastic, which were a little worn and weathered. But I kind of enjoyed how that the, the memory of the journey, evident in how crumbled that scaffold was, was also captured in this, in this embossing. And then I was asked by Scott if I could come to Ashland and I was thrilled because it's nice to work on your own and on a mini scale, but with a scaffold, it's much more fun when you can actually put it out there. And apparently everyone was very eager to help. So thank you all of you, seriously. I've never worked with more exciting and fun people. And 
I've never had the honor of having goats come visit my work either. So Burwood Ranch, which has its own goats and chickens, um, gave me an opportunity to cater to a whole set of other visitors. So this is the crew installing. Um, I know the Zoom link today with the email had a little time-lapse video, which I encourage you guys to see. And look at these guys just going. I mean, we started at two. And when I saw everyone, I was like, I don't know whether we're going to get it done. But by 6.30 or 7, it was, it was pretty much done. I was really impressed. And of course, uh, uh, Haley wanted to come and jump around. I was like, do what you want. So if anyone has more ideas, if you want to come and I don't know, jump around it, get your gorillas. If you have gorillas, do whatever you want. You know, the scaffold is essentially a stage. It's a prop that draws attention to the landscape around, to the gorgeousness of Willowit Ranch. Um, but it's also, you know, a place where you can just gather. And this Saturday, um, June 5th at four o'clock, Terry Longshow and Left Edge Percussion are going to do a performance piece on and around the scaffold. You're all invited. Yes, there's COVID, but they also know that this area is really vast. So if you want to sit here and not even sniff the person sitting there, you can do that. So please come on Saturday, June 5th, around three or four o'clock to hear Terry and his, his ensemble perform. It's going to be a little picnic. And if you can wear yellow and bring a rug that's pink or red, that'd be perfect. And I think Scott took this image, so I had to screen it because it's absolutely adorable. Screenshot the thing from Instagram. And that's basically um, you know, an overview of what I do as an artist. This is just a quick preview or just a little tip of the iceberg of my interest in writing and creating a space where concepts that I'm not directly talking about in my work can be addressed themes such as globalization, gender, ethnicity, et cetera, that are all covered in Drain Magazine. Drain Magazine is an online peer reviewed journal that I started with Adrian Parr and Selena Jeffrey in 2004 in a small coffee shop in Savannah, Georgia. And it has since then grown. So I, check you guys, I encourage you guys to check out drainmag.com as well, because that's something else that I do do. And that is all she wrote. That's the end of my Eugene Marathon in 2012. 12, no, 14. Thank you, Avantika. Yeah. Um, if anybody has any questions, you may type those into the chat and I can read them aloud, or you can unmute yourself and share your video and ask Avantika directly. Um, I see a I question in the chat already from Simone. Avantika, you are quite busy and prolific. How far out are you booked with projects? Can you speak about any of your future projects? Uh, thank you, Simone, and thanks for re repeating the question. So I have to drive to Ashland tomorrow because this next thing I'm doing on Saturday is very important. It is, it is like for me, that's like the big grand opening. So I consider that a project and I hope you all will, will come for that. Um, I'm part of a, a group show at the Bellevue Art Museum in November. It's a biannual that deals with uh, urban spaces and architecture. And I'm doing something in showroom windows in Mumbai, India in November as well. And there's something else. But yeah, how do I do this? I, I get people like you guys to help me. And you all are so kind and help me. So it's possible. I also am very grateful to be in a career, which is teaching, that gives me the time and, and allows me to make work. So being in academia is kind of cool. Yes, those meetings are annoying and boring, but at the end of the day, when you technically get your three months off, but you're really just going from one site to another to make art, it's very cool. Uh, before we get to Chella's question uh, in, re in regards to future projects, you also just completed some very recent projects yes. on the travel. Can you tell us uh, briefly about where you just were? 
Yeah, I was at Yucca Valley Material Lab, which is in Yucca Valley, California. It's a space that was started by Heidi Schwegler, who lived in Oregon for 21 years and was the chair of the Applied Craft and Design Program at PNCA slash OCAC. She decided to just create this new space where artists could go to the middle of the desert and learn how to work in either metal or glass. Yucca Valley Material Lab, I encourage you guys to check it out. And while I was there, I decided I was granted this residency thanks to the Ford Family Foundation again. Um, I learned how to work in glass and I realized working in glass is very, very hard. But it is very, very, very satisfying. And I'm making a scaffolding in glass again. And I posted some process images of that on, on Instagram. So check those out. And right after Yucca Valley, I went to Iris Projects in Venice Beach, California. And just, you know, basically hung around, went to Muscle Beach, met people in the studio and enjoyed the sunniness of California. That sounds nice. Uh, Chela, would you like to unmute and ask Avantika? I would love to. Um, so something that I interested me in listening to your artist talk was kind of hearing how you sit with the two sort of different sides of your practice. So you have this one side that's the more traditional two-dimensional side. And you talked about how you really value this because you have sort of complete control and you don't need to depend on anyone else to do it. But then there's also this like, like enormous scale, like sort of sculptural, relational, site specific mm -hmm. side of your practice where it is completely involved with lots of other people. Like I had the pleasure of actually getting to experience that. Yeah. And I guess I'm kind of wondering about how you sort of balance these two very different practices because it seems like they kind of intersect a lot but they're very different ways of art making and whether like one feels more important, more genuine or if they are necessary for each other. I, I think they, it's, exact, it's exactly that they are necessary for each other. I like that monastic individual practice but for those of you who've worked with me, I'm a highly extroverted person and I like hanging out with people and doing these things and I like to travel a lot so every time I do it no one's going to invite me for a week to do drawings of the Colosseum I make the Colosseum drawings and I have to figure out how to ship them and I don't like dealing with shipping but if I have to go make an installation in the middle of some small place in Canada I can do that and, you know there's it's like it's like travel it's like art tourism and travel on a whole other level you get to know the geography the history the home depot the best dive bar it's a whole new experience of just understanding space and time and the and people but because because of that sometimes you know that that's great but sometimes it's, it's too much and it's like i can't you know working with you guys was a very unusual experience very often it's like no this is eight to five and then you're like i still need to do more but i can't physically do that and you're just twiddling your thumbs so i don't like that dependence but if i have to go to my studio and make another drawing of a building i can do that so i like it the they're opposite sides of the same coin and they fuel each other. And that's important to me. Thank you, Jella. Uh, anybody else at home would like to uh, ask Vantika a question directly or type something into the chat? Uh, if not, I have a oh, Cody Bustamante. Hi, Cody, would you like to unmute? I'm just waving hi. Hey, nice to see you. Nice to see you. So I guess I, I wanted to change things up a little bit. And, you know, I have not seen enthusiasm like I did from Tari, Chela, Zach, Megan, uh, Leslie, all of you. Why did you guys do this? I mean, we barely paid you. We just gave you some dried mango, maybe some Hendrix, but like, why? I mean, I know it's great experience, exposure, but yeah, well, what made you want to do this? Well, I, I got wrangled into it. I didn't really even know what was happening. Uh -huh. um, but you like brought the party. <laughs> like it was really fun. Like not only did you bring like this incredibly beautiful sculpture out in into this area, but you, you're you just like really fun to hang out with. <laughs> um, and just like the whole experience of installing it was like a good time good. just around like good people and yeah. being able to like swing around on this giant sculpture was just 
it was awesome. <laughs> I think the pandemic may have helped because you were like locked up little creatures who finally got to get out too. Yeah, I was going to say something about that. Like, obviously, I would have been really excited to participate in something like this anytime because I think for a lot of us who are like in art school down here, like this is kind of the kind of stuff we hope to do for our whole lives. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of this like, like transcendental moment of like coming out of the pandemic and then all of a sudden participating in this beautiful like collective action and putting up something bigger than ourselves and doing it together. It was like, it was so much fun. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Patika. I, I was so happy, pleased, and proud of our you know local community coming together. And um, and I agree, people work very hard, um, mm -hmm. very energetic on this. And uh, I myself was was blown away and very happy to see young artists take advantage of an opportunity to meet somebody who is experienced um, as you are. Um, anybody else, any, any questions you want to type in the chat or ask directly? We have time for maybe one more question. Last call. Okay, if, if not, uh, we will end it there. Avantika, thank you so much for your time today and incredible ambitious sculpture at Willowit Ranch. And as you said, Terry Longshore and Left Edge Percussion will be performing a new composed piece specifically mm -hmm. for your scaffold tomorrow, excuse me, Saturday, Saturday, June 5th mm -hmm. at 4 p.m. Um, we will have that professionally recorded and made available to audiences later, mm -hmm. but there's nothing like seeing it, mm -hmm. witnessing it and hearing it in person. Yes. So, yep. yep. And I just, again, just want to thank you again, Scott and everyone, and uh, Anita and Suzanne of the Willowit Ranch, who gave us the space to make this possible. And to all my friends in Portland, Jonathan Swanson, and my crew at Washington State University, who also helped me with all of this. Um, Ashton's a very cool place, you guys. Just know that. Thank you, Avantika. Yeah. Bye, and everybody. Scott's amazing to work with. Again, thank you and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you.